All right, welcome to the May 1st, 2024 episode of the Jason Modar Show. You can find the show on YouTube, podcasting platforms, and the written versions of some episodes on the Jason Modar Show substack. Well, today I'm going to be continuing my series on Ligon Duncan's appearance on Sean DeMar's Room for Nuance podcast. And as I always like to say, there is always room for nuance on the Jason Modar Show. Actually, that's not true. I never say that. But we're going to continue in the series. Eventually, or initially, I thought I wouldn't continue doing this series because of Sean DeMar's mashup with Doug Wilson and Joe Rigney. And that was a, a phenomenal episode. If you haven't watched that, by the way, they went on there and those three gentlemen had a discussion. And it was Sean interviewing Doug and giving Doug a chance to respond to his interview with Ligon Duncan, his being Sean's interview with Ligon Duncan. And I thought they did a great job. I mean, there are a few things that I would quibble with here and there, but not enough to do some sort of a video series response to that interview. Although A.D. Robles is in the middle of doing one, so if you're interested in his commentary, which is always excellent, on Sean DeMars, Joe Rigney, and Doug Wilson getting together, I'd highly recommend that on A.D.'s channel. It's phenomenal. Anyway, I wanted to continue mine because, well, number one, I wanted to be a man of my word. That's something that I would expect of my male students and of my own son, so I should hold myself to that standard as well. I said that I would do the video series, so I'm going to continue it better late than never. Plus, I I want to. I'm interested in saying some more things about it, especially in light of Sean DeMar's mashing things up with Doug Wilson and friends when he met with Rigney and Wilson. And... You know, people are interested in me continuing to talk about it, so I'm going to continue to do so. So let me go ahead and get things set up. Just a few clicks, and we can get Ligon and Sean DeMars. So where we left off was they were talking about the Moscow mood, and they're going to revisit that conversation. I don't know if it'll happen in this episode per se, but this episode specifically is going to be them talking about Big Eva and mentioning the Gospel Coalition. It is a shorter segment of the interview, so today's episode of my show will probably be a little bit shorter than normal in terms of a video response. But anyway, so we're moving on now from the Moscow mood to talking about... Big Eva, their thought, Ligon's thoughts on Big Eva, and a little bit about the Gospel Coalition as well. And well, I'll have a lot to say about the Gospel Coalition when that comes up. But anyway, here it is: the Room for Nuance podcast, part two of the review of Ligon Duncan's appearance. Gospel of fidelity and their problems at each of those levels underneath that. I'm about to ask you about Big Eva, but because you are one of the patriarchs of it, I don't expect an honest answer from you, but let's just let's just play this game, okay? Setting a low bar for me there, Sean. <laughs> yeah. uh, wh- I mean, what do you think when people talk about this shadowy syndicate, this yeah. big machine of Big Eva? Um, he, he, uh, most of the conversation that I hear about Big Eva is complete nonsense. Uh, and it, it is funny, some of, the, some of the biggest critics of Big Eva, if there is a Big Eva, they're it. Uh, you know. He does not end up giving any examples of any of that whatsoever, the critics of Big Eva being Big Eva. Although that's really interesting if you want to critique the existence of Big Eva to say that the people who critique Big Eva are actually Big Eva. I'm not sure how that works. He doesn't further explain what he means by that, nor does he give any examples, so... We could only speculate, and I'm not interested in speculating as to what he means by that comment. It's such a vapid comment uh, anyway. So, But I did have another thought. So we all know what Big Eva is. Doug Wilson, on that Room for Nuance mashup podcast, he said that Big Eva is the cool kids. It's the evangelical cool kids. The guys and gals who get to write articles, who are evangelical Christians, who get to write articles for The Atlantic and The New York Times. The guys and gals who are headlining the big major conferences. That's who Big Eva is. That's who makes up Big Eva. We know who Big Eva is. It it includes guys like Ligon Duncan. So he can be obtuse and pretend to not know who Big Eva is and attempt to deflect who Big Eva is, but we know who they are. Look, look. In one sense, it's okay. It's okay that you're a big organization and coalition of guys and gals who want to talk to each other and share each other's sermons and books and articles and things like that. That's fine. I have people on my own, in my own small network and on my own small scale that I collaborate with as well. That's totally fine. We hang out with, you know, friend groups that friends get together that like to associate and get together and do things with one another. It's, it's okay. Just 
Just admit that's who you are. Nah, that's probably asking a little bit too much. Uh, I, I, I could name organizations far larger and more extensive than the Gospel Coalition. But he doesn't. He doesn't name any of those organizations. For instance. Yeah, but boy, do they hate the Gospel Coalition. That hate the Gospel Coalition. Yeah. And Well, let's pause there, because I have a few things to say about that. So, yes, people such as myself do hate the Gospel Coalition, and we have good reason for hating the Gospel Coalition. Both Liggins and Sean's comments make it seem as if it's silly or absurd to hate the Gospel Coalition, especially in comparison to these other organizations that have far more money and apparently far more influence or whatever it is. Well, regardless of whether or not they have far more money, they're not Big Eva, and they don't have the kind of influence and pull that guys like Ligon do. Now, guys like Ligon don't have the influence and pull that they used to have, but they still do to some extent, and they did for decades and decades and made a huge impact on the evangelical landscape, especially here in America. But let's talk about the Gospel Coalition. Let me give you a handful of examples of the potentially hundreds and hundreds of examples out there of why people hate the Gospel Coalition. Yes, hate them. So, number one, they've written between... TGC's main website and TGC Australia, at least those two, multiple articles featuring Taylor Swift, her tour, and her lyrics, and how her song lyrics and her tours point people to the gospel and to Jesus Christ. Her tour is her dressing essentially like a Las Vegas showgirl, and her lyrics are at best vapid and at worst blasphemous as evidenced by what's her new song with something sin in the title i don't know she's got this new song out that has sin in the title and it's just incredibly blasphemous and she has songs that are sexually explicit her lyrics have gotten more and more vulgar and explicit over time this is the last woman on planet earth you would want to use to bring people to the gospel of jesus christ because at minimum, you're going to get a completely distorted version of the gospel and what Jesus is if you're attempting to compare it to a woman like Taylor Swift. So that's one reason why people despise the Gospel Coalition, because they write articles about Taylor Swift. You're the flipping Gospel Coalition. What are you doing writing articles about Taylor Swift and comparing her positively to Christ and the gospel? They have also written a number of articles that they've later either scrubbed and deleted or hid from their search engine. So... I've actually done a couple of videos myself on some of these articles. There was one article written by a pastor about Kyle Rittenhouse who shot and killed a couple of men and injured another who were attempting to assault and kill him during the riots, I think, of 2020. And he was exonerated, as he should have been, by a court of law and was found not guilty of murder or manslaughter or whatever they were trying to charge him with because they were he was uh, defending himself when he killed those men and he shot those men. So the author of the article, again, an article that TGC published, he attempted to compare Kyle Rittenhouse's self-defense shooting to what Dylan Roof did. And if you don't remember who Dylan Roof is, Dylan Roof is the white supremacist, like the actual white supremacist, not a David French white supremacist, not an MSNBC white supremacist, an actual I hate black people because they're black white supremacist. He went to a, an all-black church and shot and killed over half a dozen people at that all-black church because they were black and because he hated black people he tried the author tried to compare dylan roof or kyle rittenhouse rather to that guy to dylan roof when the gospel coalition was rightfully castigated for it what did they do they hid the article from their website's search engine they offered a very pathetic editor's note and excuse for the article and they made very superficial changes to the article that altered the content of the article in a very superficial sort of way and didn't really change the content much at all there was another article i i covered in a video i can't remember who the author was but he's a pastor who wrote a book and the article that tgc published was an excerpt from his book and in this excerpt he compared the holy spirit entering a person to intercourse to vaginal penetration now the article was cringy and awkward and, and bizarre and weird, but I wasn't offended by the article. What I was offended by was how the Gospel Coalition handled it. So they were again castigated for that article from both sides of the political aisle, but especially from feminists and squishy evangelical feminists and just kind of generally squishy evangelifish types who are more left-leaning and feminist-leaning. 
So the Gospel Coalition scrubbed the article from their website, stopped either, I don't know, if, I can't remember if they were pu publishing the guy's book or if they were just promoting it. I think they were just promoting it. They stopped promoting the book. I believe his book was no longer published, and he had a ministry position with an organization started by Tim Keller that he essentially got fired from. So the Gospel Coalition took this guy, a guy whose article they voluntarily published and threw him directly under the bus. And then there was a video that, this was another thing that I covered on my podcast a number of years ago, starring Rachel Gilson, who is a, an LGBTQ-friendly evangelical Christian, and the Gospel Coalition put out a video of her telling Christians that it is completely compatible with Christianity for Christians to practice pronoun hospitality, which is, of course, not true because pronoun hospitality is a sin. Number one, it's lying, and number two, it's encouraging covetousness because you are encouraging transgender people to desire something and possess something that they ought not desire and that they ought not want to possess and something that they could never even possess, which is a different gender, a different sexual identity. It's so funny. I remember... Rachel Gilson, so when she she offered in the video kind of two perspectives. It was Christians who don't feel comfortable practicing pronoun hospitality and Christians who do. And when she was talking about Christians who don't feel comfortable practicing pronoun hospitality, she was saying things like, you know, and I understand that there are Christians who, you know, think this is maybe a lie or whatever, and they're not comfortable practicing it. And then when she talked about Christians who do affirm practicing pronoun hospitality she like lit up oh but then there are others of us who just think it's so wonderful and great to use their preferred pronouns she just gushed so you could tell what her persuasion was but there's gospel coalition publishing a video with a woman advocating that christians sin and promote the breaking of commandments that that video reminded me of when i was 16 the first job i ever got was i worked for a renaissance fair and i remember it was orient i think it was orientation and me and my buddy were there and they were I don't know, there were at least a dozen of us there for this orientation, a, a group mixed of guys and girls. And the guy who was doing the orientation was clearly gay. He was clearly a homosexual. And he was talking about some of the benefits of working for the Renaissance Fair. And at first he addressed the, the gentleman. He said, now, guys, there are some cute, good-looking girls here. There are a lot of pretty girls here. You'll enjoy working at the Renaissance Fair. And then when he addressed the women... When he addressed the young girls who were applying for the job as well, he addressed them, and then his, his inner homosexual came out. He went, and girls, the boys here are so cute. And I'm going to stop doing a, a homosexual impersonation, but he lit up when he started talking about the attractive men at the Renaissance Fair for the women. Now, needless to say, that whole orientation had all sorts of problems, but it reminded me of Rachel Gilson's reaction to telling Christians that they ought to practice pronoun hospitality. And again, that is something that the Gospel Coalition promoted, something, a video that they published and said, yes, we effectively, we approve of this. We think this is a good conversation to have. That's why people don't like the Gospel Coalition. And they've got more money, mm -hmm. they've got more reach, they've got more, you know, all, and, 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 and they'll jump in on the Big Eva conversation. So a lot of it is just nonsense, and I pay no attention to it whatsoever. You pay no attention to it whatsoever, yet you could name critics, supposedly you could name critics of Big Eva, who actually are themselves Big Eva. You could name the critics, and you could name organizations that are bigger than the Big Eva organizations. Obviously you don't, or excuse me, obviously you do pay attention to it. You don't refrain from paying attention to it. I would, I would imagine you actively pay attention to it considering how much you claim to know about various individuals and organizations with the so-called label of Big Eva. Now, um, you know, have, have, there, have, have, have people been disappointed by leaders unwilling to take stands on important things? Sure, I'm sure that's happened. Yeah. You know, welcome to the fallen world. Then, uh, yes, we're all fallen, but that doesn't excuse those poor leadership decisions. And some of them are atrocious leadership posi positions to take, like encouraging Christians to lie, to break a commandment, and encourage other Christians to break another commandment, coveting. You're encouraging Christians to break commandments. Yeah, and the thing is, though, so many of these mistakes that are made, these lapses of judgment, there's never an apology, there's never an I was wrong. None of that ever happens. Or if it does happen, it's 
few and far between when it actually does happen. Any apologies for get the vax? Any apologies for wear the mask? Any apologies for, yeah, we should march with Black Lives Matter? Any apologies for shut down your churches? Any apologies for any of that? No, none at all. And uh, I, I want us to be people of principle. And sometimes that means calling out people that we love and care about. But you can, you can do that in such a way that is not, we have a culture in, in, a, in a part of evangelical right, uh, evangelicalism right now that is desensitized to its own spirit of mocking and slander. Mm -hmm. And that's, that kind of goes back. To so he's about to get back into the Moscow mood. And what is the next one? The next one's on mocking and slander. So he's going to talk about mocking and slander. He's going to come back around to the Moscow mood. So I'm going to go ahead and stop here for now for today. What's interesting when he gets back to the Moscow mood and he talks about uh, mocking and slander is he accuses them of mockery and he accuses them of slander while for this not entire episode, but for much of the episode, ever since he started talking about Doug Wilson and the guys up in Moscow, he's actually been engaged in the very thing that he's accusing them of engaging in, which is slander. But we'll cover that in the next episode, which hopefully will come out soon. I mean, hey, how about this? An episode released two days in a row. That's got to be some sort of a record for me. Well, anyway, that was today's episode. Appreciate you guys swinging by and checking it out. We'll catch you next time for part three.